Kitco Mining special coverage of Fast Markets Lithium Supply and Battery Raw Materials is brought to you by Lindy and Resources. Alberta is well known for its oil. Chris Darmos wants to make it well known for its lithium too. Chris is CEO and founder of E3 Metals. Welcome back to Kiko, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me. A lot to catch up on. Can you tell us about some of the latest developments at Ag3 Metals? I noticed there's been some funding announcements and uh, also you added some organizational app. Yeah, so we, uh, we're we very excited right now. We're on the on the precipice of our pilot starting. Um, construction's underway right now to get that up and up and running. And, uh, probably the next six to eight weeks, we're going to have uh, brine flowing through our direct extraction unit. Uh, so very, very excited. It's been a long time uh, in the making, obviously, as we've been developing that technology. Uh, we recently announced that we're going to be testing also a third-party technology. We're very excited. We work with a great partner um, to look at uh, other alternatives as well, because at the end of the day, E3 has a, a pretty significant resource base of about 16 million tons measured and indicated, and that's just one of our areas. Um, and so from our perspective, we're looking to develop this resource as a primary function for E3. So very excited about that. We're, we're kicking off our pre-feasibility study. We announced um, working with Fleur to get that going. Um, that we expect to have completed at the end of this year and then the, the public report uh, sometime at the end of this year or early Q1. And so a lot of heavy lifting going on on the technology and the engineering side uh, right now at E3. We've got, as you mentioned, uh, 30 people now at the company uh, and that's going to grow again once the pre fees is uh, wrapping up. We start the detailed design feasibility phase, which will start early 24. Um, again, we'll probably go through another big uh, ramp up in staff to get ready to go into the construction phase in sort of late 25, mid to late 25. I mean, uh, you talk a little bit more about uh, the production uh, that you're working to as well, too. Do you have an idea of cost of production, for example, and what the ramp up is going to be? And then also kind of a couple of years out, Chris. Um, for the commercial facility, we're looking at um, start somewhere, starting somewhere between 20 and 30,000 tons a year. Um, and that's going to be finalized throughout the pre-feasibility study. Uh, it's really about balancing cost of capital um, against the, what the market is looking for in terms of the product, to the quality, and what we can deliver. I'm um, working with great partners across the board for the technology. Uh, we're developing very deep relationships with um, potential customers as we go through this year. Um, we're going to be looking to bring a lot of these companies uh, to the site. Um, a lot of um, our, the development partners that we have mm -hmm. to understand how the direct extraction is working for us specifically, which is a really important piece of the story right now is direct extraction is becoming more and more common, mm -hmm. um, but it's still important to test it on your particular brine in a, as, as close to real world conditions as you can possibly make, which is why piloting on the field is so important. Um, and you can find pictures of what that looks like on our website. We'll be posting them throughout the, the pilot operations as well. Um, and so looking to have that um, you know, wrapping up here later this year uh, and, and really proving that the sort of commerciality of direct extraction on our site specifically to our brine um, is there. Mm. And then obviously that feeds into the, the, the bigger picture of going to commercial. And that really determines the scale um, and, and the scale being a, a mix of economics versus capital that you have to deploy. Um, looking through your uh, corporate presentation, you kind of have two streams when I look at as well, too. You're talking about advancing production, but you're also talking about advancing the tech as well. Yes. Too. Yeah, so we have um, 16 million ton measured indicator resource base. This is one of the largest single deposits of lithium uh, in the world, so it is globally significant. It's really a, a factor of the size of this aquifer you know, mm -hmm. um, that was discovered in the 40s by Imperial Oil, and, and we have now uh, are in the process of transitioning this very historic asset into becoming a lithium producer. Mm -hmm. And that, that asset enables us to start at, at uh, 20, 30,000 ton per year start, but scale to probably somewhere around 150,000 tons. So so the scale potential is there, and that, that is really the value that E3 has. Mm -hmm. um, the technology is something that we've been developing um, since 2016. Um, we're very proud of the work that we've done, um, but at the end of the day, the, the DNA of E3 is a resource development company, so the technology for us enables us to extract the lithium from the brine, um, and it, it is a huge advantage to the company in terms of its cost, um, and to the fact that we own it. Um, there's no fees that we have to pay to use it, so that's very important to us. Um, it has a really nice synergy with some of the newer technologies, such as electrical conversion for lithium hydroxide, which you're seeing come become more prevalent. 
Um, but again, at the end of the day, we're not a technology development company. Our DNA is more resource development. So we, we, but we do have the two pillars and they're very important for us because um, both of them combined create the value that E3 has uh, to bring to the market. Uh, do you have a sense of uh, the uh, amount of resources, amount of investment that's going into driving DLV technology? Uh, I, I ask because some, I just don't see that many headlines about it. You know, I look at uh, battery recycling and then you see like the hundreds of millions that are going into something like a Redwood or going into a Lie Cycle, for example. And then I see the odd snippets there. Uh, do you have a sense of the size of the people? Because, I mean, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of people that are in the SaaS. Yeah, I think that the technologies are advancing uh, to the point now where you're seeing probably three or four leaders um, in terms of the, the time to commerciality. And, and some of those you're going to see start to operate in 2025. And the investments are there, but the, you know, the real development, so there's a couple that are starting in 25, but there's not a big list. The bigger list is more 26, 27, 28, 29. Um, and I think from that perspective, it's probably why you're seeing investment in more headlines into the recycling. But on the other side of it also, um, you know, mining and resource extraction activities, um, you know, we're on the brine production side of that fence, um, is not as sexy as something like a battery recycling plant or battery self manufacturing facility. Um, but the, the issue is, is that without that primary source, being a resource extraction um, project, there is no recycling. You need the lithium out of the ground first. There's no batteries without a primary extraction. So, um, you know, the investments, you might see the headlines because they, they sound nice, and battery recycling facility being manufactured at XYZ. The resource extraction um, is, the, is the absolutely necessary piece and it is getting funded. Um, in DLE, our projects are getting funded across the globe uh, to the point where, you know, in the next in three to four years, I think they're going to become the market normalizer. You know, we're, we're worried about supply. There's lots of conversation going on at this conference about, you know, we need to get lithium out to the market because we, we want lithium batteries to be the dominant battery chemistry. And we don't want to give the market an excuse to move off of them. Mm. And that requires people being able to meet supply. Um, and to be able to grow the battery supply with the, the raw material. I think from the lithium perspective, DLE is going to be that piece that when it comes in, it's going to be able to normalize the market um, and meet the supply challenges that Mund is currently facing. Talk about uh, other entrants into uh, Alberta and uh, Canada right now. Uh, gross. Yeah, Western Canada has become a bit of a hub for, for lithium. Um, the two prairie provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, have some of the largest resources on the planet. It has a combined total resource block. It's over 50 million tonnes now of resource. That's not reserve, but resources in the province. Um, and it's, it's still um, growing. The industry is still getting started. Um, but I, I be firmly believe that the Western Canadian uh, resource space will become a jurisdiction of lithium in the world. And it'll be, you know, you, you see Argentina, Chile, and you see Australia, Spodumene, um, and you're going to see Western Canada's lithium brines. Um, and, and the opportunity is, is significant. And when you look at what's happening right now from a geo geopolitical point of view, um, a North American source of lithium is becoming very important um, to get on stream and to grow battery uh, production here uh, locally, locally being the North American side of things. So um, having these sources are very important. Um, going back to uh, the tech again that you're developing, Chris, yeah. how much um, we often hear people that are uh, pushing the projects forward, whether it's going to be brine or whether it's going to be uh, hard rock, for instance, this is that you can look the chemistries where you actually pull these out from can be very different. And then you're dealing with kind of a soup of like different chemicals. So all things that you have to separate out of as well too. But when you're developing your own tech and when you're applying it here, and then when you see it, you know, as you take your technology and it goes out licensed and is used by other people, how much is it modular? Like how much is it the same? Or how much is it, it is like beat spoke? Like it's something that somebody really has to tune and really make work. And continue on where their actual, uh, you know, hope, where their project is located. So every brine chemistry is slightly different. They all have the general same components, but they are slightly different. So there will be direct extraction technologies that will work better for some brines and not as good for others. Um, and and how you test that, how you develop the technology. A lot of the the pure technology players have developed on synthetic brines, ones that made in the lab and then tested. Uh, they do not perform, they perform way better than a real brine. And so that actually then, has, you have challenges when you go in the field, actually try to deploy it on real brine. All of these factors come into play. 
Um, when you're actually trying to tune in, as you're saying, when you bring a direct extraction process to a brine mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to make it work for that, um, it is about flow rate and it's about the, the speed at which the reaction happens, speed at which the lithium comes out of the brine um, combined with what it makes at the end of the brine. We call it a concentrate. Um, and that can have various different other elements in it other than lithium. And so um, that's why there's sort of some fit better for others because the flow rates, you need high flow rates and they need a, uh, a high purity concentrate at the back end. Um, but a lot of them can be deployed to a general brine. So some will be better fit for others. Um, but the way that ion exchange and absorption technologies work is that it is a factor of tuning um, the process so that you get maximum flow rate with maximum recovery against you know minimal impurities in the concentrate and then from that once you have that concentrate you can then remove those last bit of impurities and turn it into something that's sellable to the battery industry a carbonate or hydroxide and well you can get metal as well and so those products are what the industry is going to use mm -hmm. and that that piece of the process also requires a bit of tuning so e each of these pieces will be fit for purpose for each individual brine project but the gross, broad technology is, can be applied across them all, but um, you, you can't just take um, a unit, a C-can, throw it down on a site and it's gonna work immediately. Um, you do need to tune it, you do need to um, adjust flow rates, that sort of thing, for each individual run. We're at uh, the Lithium Show here in uh, Anderson, Nevada, and there has been kind of a split, I would say. There's uh, people that have been traditionally involved with either hard rock or um, uh, evaporation, uh, and how you say some naysayers about uh, how far uh, dilith uh, uh, direct lithium extraction can be pushed. Yeah, well, I think that all technologies start new. Hmm. And so it's easy to say, well, it's new, so it's not going to work. Um, but the reality is that in the next 18 months, you're going to see at least four projects come on stream outside of China that are using direct extraction for their primary extraction source um, at, at commercial scale, you know, 20,000 plus minus tons a year. So the industry is proving itself right now. Hmm. Um, I mean, for us, we're, we're probably a year, year and a half behind that time frame. We're believing 2026, late 2026. Yeah. Um, but the, the success of these companies is obviously very important for us to see them continue to grow and, and expand and production um, and get these things operating. Um, but I think that there's there's also a bit of fear because the, the direct extraction space um, has better ESG fundamentals and, and likely lower operating costs, especially relative to hard rock mining. And so there is a bit of a disruptive nature to direct extraction because there's a lot of opportunity for these geothermal brides. You know, we're a low temperature geothermal. You look at the Salton Sea, those are high temperature geothermal, um, but the the fundamentals for direct extraction remain the same and um, and there's a lot of them and so they can come on stream um, and um, you know look better cost a bit less and so that that is going to be disruptive and as I mentioned earlier that becomes the market normalizer you bring these projects on stream um, now there's enough lithium to supply the market um, with all of these projects and so the lithium battery technology can continue and we can all still produce into that into that industry and I think that's fundamentally important um, that you know we are able to keep up to the development in the battery technology to the needs of these cell and cam manufacturing facilities that are being built today uh, last and Chris milestones over the next 12 months yeah absolutely the big one obviously is our pilot uh, in the next couple of weeks that's going to be um, under construction and operating uh, in the next six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that follows through some um, really important testing on the development of our lithium hydroxide production work that we'll see results come out uh, here in the fall. That includes samples of lithium hydroxide we'll start looking at, talking about the quality and the specifications of that hydroxide. Um, and then into the, the later part of this year, completing the pre-feasibility study and then getting that 43-101 report out to the market like the end of this year, early next. Um, after that, we kick off feasibility. We're looking to probably continue operating the pilot um, through 2024 to continually collect data and ensure that we're getting the results that we're expecting. Um, the real design, though, uh, that we need, the, the data that will be collected to do the commercial design, we collected this year. So that'll enable us to work on feasibility, which will be a big piece of the team's work for next year. So starting Q1, we'll kick off feasibility and then run that through the rest of the year. So it's a big year. I mean, the end of this year, really, with all of the work that we're doing, we'll, we'll demonstrate that there's commerciality here at um, you know class four cost estimate size, pre-feasibility level, booking reserves in Alberta for the first time for lithium. Um, we're very excited. It's a big, big year for the company. You know, Chris, you like to speak with Kit Gawson. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Michael LeCrae here at Mass Markets 15th 
uh, lithium supply and very raw materials show in Peterson, Nevada. Kitco Mining special coverage of Fast Markets Lithium Supply and Battery Raw Materials is brought to you by Lindian Resources.